Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to uh, 33 Days of Morning Glory. Uh, it's really been a wonderful retreat I've been going through, and, and of course, reading about uh, Pope St. John Paul the Great is something that uh, you know, all of us have lived through his pontificate, uh, some of us from the very beginning, others uh, part way through. But he really was a great man and a great holy man, and uh, he had a great love for Mary and also for God's mercy. And uh, Father gave me the nice job bringing that together in the video. I thought uh, sharing that is something that uh, I never really thought about myself in the sense that uh, this uh, unification of, of uh, devotion to the, to the Immaculate Mary and then, of course, to the Divine Mercy. But you know, if we think about the two hearts, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Mary, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is also a reminder of, of Christ's great love and mercy for us. And so it would make sense. The other thing is that Mary was at the foot of the cross. And she participated in, in a very deep and intimate way in, in the passion of our Lord. And, and in a sense, um, uh, through this experience, she too has the same love of souls that Jesus does, in, in a sense. And the, the image of divine mercy is, is uh, really an image of hope that says, come to me, come to me, receive my mercy. Uh, don't, don't remain in your sin, don't remain far from me, come to me. I'll forgive you, restore you, and give you life. And, and Mary wants to do that as well by bringing us to Jesus, the source of life. Any uh, thoughts, Jane, on that? <laughs> well, it was a very special week. I think particularly, too, with uh, St. John Paul, too, is just personally as someone who was able to attend the Mass that he celebrated here in Boston when I was in high school. Um, you know, that was, um, you know, as a member of St. Mary's community, I was a part of a group that was able to go by bus. So... But for me, it was really a beautiful culmination to the four-week journey because, you know, last week, Mother Teresa asked us, St. Teresa of Calcutta, she'll always be Mother Teresa to me, but St. Teresa of Calcutta invited us to, you know, sit at the foot of the cross with Mary and Mary Magdalene and John and answer the question, I thirst, and to be the one. And this week, um, through the walk of this week, we're brought into that you know, that matriarch, that motherly journey of Mary's into her retreat, that retreat within a retreat where she takes on that role of spiritual mother. And I find that we close this fourth week sitting at the foot of the cross again um, with her, but this time with Jesus completing that by saying, uh, mother, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And really turning that spiritual motherhood and the completion of her vocation in that to us. And it really answered that question for me about when Mother Teresa asked us to enter into the Immaculate Heart of Mary and then for um, allowing Mary to enter into us. And in this, you know, uh, St. John Paul II and Father Gately talked about that, about, you know, St. John not only taking her as his mother, his spiritual mother, but taking him, taking her into his home and us taking her into the home of our hearts and allowing her to really be that mediatrix, that mediator in our lives, taking her into our heart and allowing her to walk with us and bring us closer to her son always. And for us to always, you know, in that Paschal love, allow her to be present to us in the, in the risings, and dyings of our daily life and in all things that we turn over. So, I mean, for me, it was beautiful. I learned a lot um, that I kind of had forgotten about Divine Mercy and the connection of that. Um, and I know we have a couple of questions about that, too. So, for me, it was it was a beautiful week. Um, I enjoyed the, the video with Father Gately and his enthusiasm um, about uh, St. John Paul, too. So, it was lovely to hear some of his stories as well. So, I, I think it was very well spent the four weeks in, in a very special way to spend it this week, really com coming all of us to the foot of the cross together and sitting there as the disciples of Christ, allowing us to enter into this consecration, understanding um, how she will be that mediator in all of our lives and how we can enter into her heart and allow her to enter into ours as we, I like that word, entrust ourselves to her um, in this consecration. I think that word entrustment for St. John Paul really came from his own life experience. Mm -hmm. uh, he lost his own mother at a very young age. He had an older brother who was a doctor, and he was very close to his brother. And his brother died, uh, I forget what the illness was at the time, but he, he died ministering to, his, to the sick. And then, so it was just uh, John Paul and his father. And his father died when he was, uh, I think, 20 or 19. 
basically by the, the age 20 he was by himself and, uh, and he, he made a, a conscious episode of entrusting himself to Mary. He, he may have already done the consecration but he really turned to her as his mother and uh, you know he lived that every day of his life to the very end and, and that was so evident and of course his model told us to us uh, but he was always, uh, well, he's known as a Marian Pope mm -hmm. in a sense that uh, he really took her, uh, took that to heart, and, and that's why he speaks so much about the mediation of our Blessed Mother in a sense that she truly was a mother to him. And uh, she's meant to be a mother to all of us, which was uh, Jesus' gift to us mm -hmm. uh, from the cross. Uh, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And that speaks for all of us, for we're all uh, children of God. So it was, it was beautiful. It really was a, a wonderful week uh, reflecting on. Uh, uh, Pope St. John Paul the Great and, and his, his experiences. I guess we have a couple of questions, a few tough ones uh, this week, I think, so we'll do <laughs> what we can with those. Okay. So the first question was <clears throat> that one of our retreatants had said that they're experiencing some anxiety, apprehension, and even sadness, um, and they're wondering if that's due to an interference, and is this unusual? And the second part of that question was, does consecration to Mary invite suffering? Um, okay, so let's first of all address the, uh, maybe put in a word like discouragement or the temptation to fall away, maybe. And, and it is a temptation. I think the, uh, as Father Avery said the first uh, uh, first week, that uh, you know, the evil one does not want us to be consecrated to, uh, to, the, to the Immaculate of Mary. He wants, wants us to fall away. And so whatever the, 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 the wherever we're feeling, uh, that's leading us away from this, we know it's not coming from God, okay? And, and so that's, I would say that, yeah, yeah, that is probably usual. It's something that we, we struggle with. Whenever we embark on something holy, whether it would be just 33 days more in glory, or we make a, a commitment or a Lent, we, we always feel the temptations because the, the devil wants us to throw us off track, and, and this is no different, really. Mm -hmm. uh, this consecration Mary invites suffering. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Especially as Mother Teresa talked about suffering, uniting the suffering with Christ. Well, we can't avoid suffering as human beings. It's part of uh, our human condition. Um, but I think consecration really does, does not invite suffering per se. I like to think about uh, Padre Pio. He uh, said he didn't go looking for suffering, but he, would, he accepted what came his way. I mean, that's kind of how we have to look at, our, at, at it ourselves, in a sense. Is, but what do we do with this suffering? We unite it with, with the... Uh, suffering of Jesus, we, we unite to, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and through her to, to Jesus on the cross. In a sense, um, giving meaning to this, all of us probably grew up uh, in some way, well offered up for the poor souls in purgatory, offered up for so-and-so who's sick or, or something and, and, and along those lines, to bring meaning to our suffering. The other thing is, I was reflecting on this question is, you know, when we love, we suffer more. Because we're not just suffering for ourselves, but we also suffer with our loved ones. When they're suffering, we suffer. And so in that sense, uh, if we truly love Mary, we'll, we'll, we, we're apt to suffer more because we'll start to see things through our eyes. We'll see the suffering of others, especially those who are far from God. Uh, their life becomes really a, a, a very difficult life because they, have that, they don't have that hope that we have. But through our suffering, our compassion, which means suffering with, we can maybe lead them uh, through Mary to Jesus, that they may experience healing and peace and, and things like that. So it doesn't uh, necessarily increase our suffering, but um, it does give meaning to our suffering. Uh, so. And I would just add to that too, Father, what I found sometimes too is that there's not an increase of suffering, but more of an awareness of suffering. Sometimes when we enter more deeply into our prayer life, sometimes we're not aware of some of the suffering that's around us in our own lives and others, and we become more, more aware of it as we turn to prayer which is sort of a gift because then it does allow us to offer it up more redemptively. So it's not so much that it increases so much as that our awareness uh, changes towards it. So the second question um, <clears throat> is um, surrounds itself more around the <clears throat> divine mercy. So it says that um, Father Gately talks about divine mercy on day 28. And after pondering, this retreat and says, I continue to be unclear on the correlation between the consecration to Jesus through Mary and divine mercy. Is the merciful love which Pope John Paul II identifies as the love we obtain from the Immaculate Heart of Mary drawing us closer to the fountain of mercy that is Jesus? That's the first part. This love fights evil that is identified in divine mercy readings. 
I realize evil has been around since the beginning, but is this a new concept to the church from St. John Paul II? I don't remember studying Divine Mercy. Did I miss something along the way? Also, I was surprised St. Faustina was not mentioned as she, as she inspired Divine Mer Mercy devotion. Okay, that was my last question. It was probably before the video because I think right. uh, Father Gilly did talk about her and things like that. And, and, and actually, um, John Paul was uh, instrumental in making the Divine Mercy known because he was the bishop in, in Krakow that, that uh, really pushed for this uh, Divine Mercy. He realized the translation was bad and asked Rome to take another look at it. And uh, so he really understood that Divine Mercy. Obviously, St. Faustina was Polish, he wrote in Polish. Uh, <coughs> and so he understood it very well. And so I, I, I don't think uh, she was neglected because I think Father Gately made it up. I made up for it in the video. Um, Let's go back to the cross again, I think, with the, with the Divine Mercy, uh, it, with Mary's part in that. I think it's through her co-suffering with Christ on the cross. We, you who are mothers would understand the suffering of your child. I mean, you, you feel that pain intensely. Well, you can imagine our Blessed Mother uh, watching our Lord uh, through his trial, through his way of the cross, dying on the cross, uh, pouring out his life. Uh, there was a very intimate union, and, and I think um, the movie The Passion of Christ shows that union when Jesus meets his mother on the way to the cross. It's just the, the look of glances, practically, and, and they're really communicating with one another. And, and so she truly entered it in a, in, a, in a way that was beyond all of us in a sense, entering into that passion of our Lord. So she shares in that infinite mercy of Jesus that was made available to us on the cross through, through our Lord's pierced side. Um, so I, I don't think they're, they're opposed, and nor is Mary taking us away from that. Also, getting back to the Sacred Heart again, that's also an image of God's mercy. And I, this, this divine mercy, in a sense, was a re-emphasis on the mercy of God because we, we slow to understand, or as the, you know, Moses says, this is a stiff-necked people. We, we're, we're, it's time for us to, to, to accept this great mercy of God because we, we, we know we're not worthy of this, but it just shows the depths of God's love for us as well. And so Mary leads us to that, not to be afraid to approach the mercy of God because uh, she wants what Jesus wants. She wants us to be to experience the love and mercy of God, to be to be healed and be reconciled. And so she, she in a sense, works in that way. Also remember that this 33 Days of Glory is only part one. The second part is the consecration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so perhaps some things that don't seem clear now would become clearer as we focus more on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. But Mary is never in competition with our Lord. She's always leading us to our Lord, whether it be in the Eucharist or, or to his Sacred Heart or to the Divine Mercy. She's always leading us to Jesus, and so we never should be worried about that. As far as the question about, did I miss something about divine mercy? Yeah, you know? so that just that she doesn't remember that as being a part of her formation, but that's probably because it wasn't established till he consecrated it in the year 2000, right? Yeah, well, it was, it was very strong in Poland up until about 1959 when they put a stop on it for the Universal Church, so it really hadn't spread too much this idea of mercy. But once again, that idea of mercy was always there. Even going back to the fathers of the church, they contemplated the pierced side of our Lord, which was pierced to his heart. And, and so they already re were reflecting upon uh, the, that mercy that was uh, this, the, the font of mercy already from the very early part of the church. But also the, through that open side was when Christ formed his bride, the church, in a sense, the vehicle of salvation for our world, the instrument of mercy in our world in, in many ways. Um, and, and so it does have a long history, but we forget things along the way, and, and that uh, sometimes with apparition, or in this case with divine mercy, the Lord is reminding us, don't forget this, and, and especially at this time, as um, Pope uh, St. John Paul the Great said, that this is the time of mercy, in, in the sense that we should never be afraid to avail ourselves of that mercy. So uh, I, I think it's just a reemphasis of something that's already been there that we may have forgotten or uh, put away for a while, and, and, and it's being restored to its proper place. I did like to, I think um, in the book, Father Gately said that mercy, one of the definitions from John Paul II was that mercy um, is divine love placing a limit on evil. And I liked that definition of mercy. So the second part of that question from the retreat was, there seems to be more formal praying to Mary. Is this because of the apparitions during the last century? The rosary, the chaplet, the Magnificat, our prayers to glorify Mary, can contemplative prayer fit in too? How do we how do we proceed to remain clo close to Mary? Okay, um, hmm. I think if you go back to the Second Vatican Council, we were probably more prayers to Mary in those times because one of the things they did in the Second Vatican Council was 
um, sort of to clean up the private devotions, they'd sort of gotten out of hand. And so what the council asked was to, to purify these devotions. Okay, some of them were probably, uh, and, and things really weren't worthwhile, those sort of got pushed to the side, so to speak, and maybe they remained a local tradition in some places. But what, what was most important, uh, first of all, devotion to the Sacred Heart, which goes back, every Pope has always mm -hmm. recommended that devotion to the Sacred Heart. The Rosary, every, every Pope has always recommended the Rosary and things like that. We've had this Chapel of Divine Mercy is another one. These are all very authentic devotions. They're rooted in Scripture. The Magnificat, all generations will call me blessed. That comes right out of the Gospel of Luke. So when we sing the Magnificat, giving mean praise to Mary, it's like we're in a sense fulfilling that scriptural passage, that Gospel passage. Um, so I don't know if it's anything more, but perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a more focused um, sense of praying through Mary than, than perhaps the others. Um, we, once again, we, we often use the word praying to, but it's we're praying through, we, you know, through our intercession. It, it's, uh, it's important to remember that because Protestants get, always get nervous when I mean, you're, you're praying to, to Mary, you're praying to the saints, but we only pray to God. Well, we only pray to God as well. We pray through the intercessions of the saints, just as we might ask, Jane, pray for me because I have something tough coming up. So we ask somebody to help. So we, we're asking our Blessed Mother to help us with prayer. We're asking the saints to help us with prayer. And some saints are known to help us, like St. Anthony, to find things that are lost, which he's one of my most He's like, you saints. again? <laughs> so I keep him busy. <laughs> what I do you with again, Father <laughs> Cannon. <laughs> what I do with my glasses. <laughs> so anyway, they are meant to be our friends and to help us along the way. Um, I think there was another question, too, that, um, that first one that we didn't get to... Uh, Respect the total gift of all I have and all that I am. What does that mean? And also tied into that was, what does the exterior good mean? Uh, I think that really the first question that ties it everything together because <clears throat> we're, we're, when we consecrate ourselves, we're, we're promising to give everything that I am, who I am as a human being, the, the verb to be means to be, to, the, the, everything that I, that, that I am as a human person. I, I'm, I'm going to uh, consecrate to Mary and through her to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. All, all that I have, in a sense, all that I have is, is really is a gift from God. If we, we don't often think about that. Obviously, we have to work hard and things like that. But everything that we have is a gift from God. If we go back to the Trinity, what's happening in the Trinity? It's the love of the Father poured out to the Son who receives everything of the Father, embraces it, and gives it back to God the Father, and that's shared in the Holy Spirit. Well, in a sense, we do the same things. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is symbolize an almsgiving, in a sense. God has blessed us richly, and so therefore I give back to, to God, well, through the church and to the needy and things like that. Uh, so everything we have is meant to, 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 to be at the service of this consecration. It doesn't mean that we give everything away. It means that we're willing to use those things that we've received from the Lord uh, to build up his kingdom and bring others to, to, to Jesus through Mary. Yeah. The exterior uh, good, of course, would be those things that, that perhaps we, we have, that are different possessions, things like that. Once again, it's not like we give those all away. Some people are called to do that. We know in the Gospel, the rich young man, he refuses to give things away. You know, St. Anthony in the desert, he was called to give things away, and he did. He lived uh, to be a monk out in the desert, but you know, most of us are called to, to use those things that we have for building up the kingdom of God, in, in a sense. Uh, Bishop Barron likes to quote... Uh, Cardinal George, if I can remember it exactly. He's speaking to wealthy donors, he said, thank God for the poor. He said, because they're your path to salvation. So, and then he said, thank God, to the, and the poor thanks God for you, because through you, you know, they're, they're able to, to live their lives. So, you know, we need one another, depending on what we have, in a sense. And uh, so that every, everything that we have is meant to be, to be shared and given back to God in some way. Anything else? That was it. I just it made me think about one of the things I always think about is that um, I have a real um, attraction to different rosary beads, um, you know, particularly ones that have specific meaning to me. And it always seems inevitably that someone wants the rosary beads that I have, right? That someone comes along and says, "I like those rosary beads," and um, you know, I don't have any rosary beads. And there's a practice that. Um, I don't know, you know, my mother told me that if anybody ever asked for your rosary beads, you should always give it, give them your rosary beads, no matter how important they are to you. And, and it, and I said, okay, you know, I've kind of learned that. So every time I give my rosary beads, it's inevitable that within an hour of giving them away, I find another pair, that another pair shows up. And I kind of feel that that is just the way that when we let go of something that has um, significant meaning to us in a worldly sense, that 
um, in, in turning that over to the larger meaning of what, what God wants or we entrust to Mary, that the grace and, and what we get back from them is so much more significant. So I never hold on to anything. Anything that I really want to hold on to, I probably know I shouldn't, right? And so um, I pray about that. And those are the things that I know in the questions this week in the participants workbook, it talks about some of those things that are hard for us to give up or um, things that we want to hold on to as we walk towards this consecration. And those are things that we continue to ponder as we head towards these last week towards consecration about those things that um, are still in our hearts as we this week reflect upon the four weeks that we've had each day with the different with the previous saint of that week. So um, we'll continue on the journey together. This will be a nice week to just kind of go back and I think uh, Father Gailey takes a step by step going through once again these four uh, models for us but but also to, to deepen our understanding of consecration. I was talking with somebody and I, I believe our consecration is something that we kind of grow into. It's like everything in life. We, mm -hmm. we don't just all of a sudden, we, we grow into that. We make the commitment and the promise and then our blessed mother leads us away to deepen that consecration. So don't worry, like I didn't get enough of this, so I maybe I should do this again. You know, we're gonna make the consecration, we're gonna have a, a special mass. It was providential that it's gonna be for the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which is mm -hmm. such an important uh, uh, feast. And, and uh, she told us, um, Fatima, the importance of her Immaculate Heart, her immac and the end my Immaculate Heart will triumph, in a sense. So it's really a wonderful, uh, of all uh, the days, Mary, this is one of the best ones I think we could have chosen. Uh, as I said, very providentially, just worked out timing-wise uh, to do that. So we're going to gather Saturday, 10 o'clock in the church, and we'll have a nice Mass for the, uh, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. At, at the end of Mass, we'll all make the consecration together, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll just let Mary take over. Uh, We'll journey together. We can support one another. I know Jane has put out the different emails and things, and I know there's other people from, from outside our parish, and it's, I'm glad you've journeyed with us, and perhaps you've made some uh, connection via your email, whatever. Uh, keep journeying in faith wherever you are, whether you're in the parish or not, and, and to know from the depths of your heart how much Jesus loves you through his mother, and how much a mother, a blessed mother wants to lead you to that heart of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And uh, I have to admit that I forgot the prayer again, even though Bridget reminded me, so <laughs> let's at least conclude with a prayer, okay? Uh, anyway, I need people to keep me on track. I know. So. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. So let's, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women, and, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Immaculate Heart of Mary. Pray for us. Pope St. John Paul the Great. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we'll see you with those in the parish uh, Saturday at church, and then we'll be back uh, next Monday for a wrap-up on uh, sort of tying everything together on this beautiful 33 Days of Morning Glory. God bless you. God bless.